All right, shall we get started? Good morning here from Minneapolis, Colin. Uh, it's a pleasure to host you virtually. I uh, wish we could have done this in person, but maybe in the coming years after so many variants will be discovered and we'll hopefully we'll get immunized one way or the other. But it's a pleasure to host uh, Professor Colin Berry here, who is the Chair of Cardiology and Imaging at the University of Glasgow, Scotland. He's the Director of the British Heart Foundation Research Center of Excellence at the University and the Director of Research with the Golden Jubilee National Hospital and Consultant Cardiology at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow. He's also Executive Editor at the European Heart Journal. Every Wednesday we get together and we always discuss some very interesting papers. I've learned a lot from him. And that's one of the reasons that we asked uh, him to take and consider uh, this talk today. Um, Kelly, uh, Barry is a very um, uh, you know, prolific author who has devoted a lot of his research time into the understanding of very common clinical problems, particularly this idea of ischemic heart disease or angional symptoms in the absence of coronary, obstructive coronary artery disease. Uh, there's lots of uh, you know, accolades into his very prolific uh, CV. Uh, needless to say, he was one of the first uh, British clinicians to participate in TAVR when he was in Montreal and learned and spent time also with Andrew Rye at the NIH and have uh, had the great interactions at the SCMR. And I hope to see him in upcoming February if that will be in person. He, today we'll be speaking about the stratify medicine in chest pain syndrome, and this is really a privilege to hear from one of the thought leaders in this field. So calling the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yao, for that kind introduction. Uh, so uh, stratified medicine and ischemic heart disease. I hope you all can hear me well. Also just get the slides advancing, there we go. <clears throat> so these are my institutional disclosures. I hold no personal uh, contracts. So in the coming 40, 45 minutes, I will uh, share with you the following objectives. Uh, first of all, to create awareness on small vessel disease and how it leads to angina ischemic syndromes, to describe and define stratify medicine, and to share with you some future directions be it new trials, systemic implications, sex disparities, and guidelines. So, in the United Kingdom, around 1 million visits each year happen for uh, chest pain, typically to chest pain units uh, at the interface of primary and secondary care. Based on the 1995 guideline, CT coronary angiography is now the default approach where feasible for uh, the diagnostic evaluation of uh, these patients. Well, we know from the Scott Heart trial that one in five patients um, may have an obstructive coronary artery stenosis. That trial actually included patients with coronary heart disease. So I think the prevalence of obstructive disease in patients with no prior coronary heart disease presenting with chest pain is probably much lower, possibly even one in 10. So what of the large majority of symptomatic patients who do not have obstructive coronary disease? What is the explanation for their chest symptoms? Well, of course, some of these patients will have non-cardiac chest pain, but a, a, an appreciable proportion, perhaps two in five, that's 400,000 uh, patients uh, each year in this NHS context, two in five might have small vessel disease. And the anatomical approach espoused by CT coronary angiography will inevitably lead to systematic underdiagnosis and suboptimal management of affected patients with uncertain clinical outcomes thereafter. This is a stereo arteriogram um, photographed or imaged by my late colleague, Dr. William Fulton, whose work developed in the 1950s and 1960s using a perfusion apparatus, which is illustrated on the left, and using explanted hearts obtained in the pathology department of a Stop Hill Hospital in Glasgow 
He set up a perfusion apparatus with a bismuth micro solution and perfused the coronary arteries at physiological levels of blood pressure and revealed these amazing images, which um, you can clearly see the micro vessels and indeed their connections in this heart, which is uh, free of atherosclerosis. So, um, which test should be performed first? The CT approach or a functional approach, such as to detect uh, ischemia? This is the classic paradigm, obstructive coronary artery disease. We understand this well because we can see the problem with our coronary artery narrowing, and we know that the artery may be narrowed or blocked in a symptomatic patient. Much is known about the diagnosis, pathophysiology, and treatment of coronary artery disease. Much less is known about small vessel disease in the heart, simply because we are unable to appreciate it in vivo. And these are the relevant conditions, microvascular angina and or vasospastic angina. And is this important? Well, there are epidemiological studies to attest that this may well be the case. So this is a prognostic study from Copenhagen in 1998 to 2009, where unselected patients attending for coronary angiography were uh, followed up uh, with their clinical outcomes, MACE free survival, dichotomized according to the presence of atherosclerosis, albeit by angiography, and one, two, three vessel disease. Um, age, sex, match controls were also introduced. And you can see that um, compared to asymptomatic controls, even uh, normal coronary arteries was associated with a, a worse prognosis, which of course extended incrementally as the presence and extent of, of coronary artery disease became evident. But clearly there is a gap here on specific testing for ischemia or microvascular disease. Here um, is uh, the, on the left, the distribution of microvascular resistance and coronary flow reserve. The first thing to, to show or take from this plot on the left um, is that uh, there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence and indeed these metrics are different. And then if you look at prognosis, cumulative incidence of cardiovascular events, this is a study undertaken in, in Korea. Uh, I think the sample size is around 400 patients. You will see that uh, in plot D, the combination of impaired coronary flow reserve and increased microvascular resistance has incremental adverse prognostic significance. Although the event rates are lower for either abnormality in isolation, probably there would be some association uh, uh, there with each also compared to normal. So perhaps uh, assessing small vessel disease would be clinically relevant. In the NHS, I'm, I think I have, I myself have worked in North America and I, there are many similarities in the healthcare systems, but this is the National Health Service and at each point in the care pathway, um, cost constrained public service provider, um, whether it's the exercise test or now CT coronary angiography or indeed in the cath lab at each point progressively downstream in the care pathway, patients with salt small vessel disease will be systematically missed based on these test approaches. Medicine benefits from technology, and that's certainly the case for the evaluation of uh, coronary physiology in the cardiac cath lab. And on um, the top right, you will see uh, it, uh, an image, an angiogram with multiple coronary artery narrowings. And the question is which of these, one, none, or all would be limiting blood flow at the level of the coronary artery. And we now have pressure sensitive coronary guide wires enabling the cardiologist in the cath lab to instrument an individual coronary artery and assess for a pressure gradient. Um, and indeed this is now evidence-based through fractional flow reserve 
and non-hyperemic uh, pressure ratios. Well, um, one of the vendor technologies uh, includes a pressure and temperature sensitive sensor, uh, three centimeters from the distal tip of the, of the guide wire. And this allows integration of fractional flow reserve, or indeed a resting re uh, pressure ratio, plus coronary flow reserve and the index of microvascular resistance. This allows the clinician in the cath lab to assess for flow limiting disease and assess for microvascular function, be it a functional problem that is impaired CFR or a structural problem that is increasing microvascular resistance. And this plot depicts, if we just go through this sequentially, on the top left, you will see that there is obstructive uh, coronary atheral sclerosis with a reduced FFR and microvascular disease with an increase in IMR and a reduction in CFR. And hence, we can segment a diagnosis based on the test results. On the top right, it's a focal stenosis with preserved microcirculatory function. Bottom left, it is micro isolated microvascular disease. Bottom right, it is diffuse atherosclerosis, which is non-flow limiting uh, and in association with microvascular dysfunction. And this is a schematic figure for what the clinician in the cath lab uh, is potentially able to do. Uh, on the left is a, a clinical flow leading to a diagnosis of vasospastic angina. On the right is a clinical flow leading to a diagnosis of microvascular angina. If we look to the middle, this, the, the diagnostic steps initially involve the coronary angiogram, which of course is, is extremely useful. Um, next, you would pass the guide wire, allowing using a technique called coronary thermal dilution to assess for coronary flow reserve and microvascular resistance. And then what we have undertaken is to bring, bring in pharmacological testing through the adjunct, adjunctive use of acetylcholine testing um, to assess for epicardial spasm and microvascular spasm, and then to form a diagnosis, which uh, simplistically could be considered as being microvascular disease dash angina, vasospastic angina, mixed, non-cardiac, or indeed, if the pressure wire reveals flow limiting disease, that hadn't been detected by the angiogram, we can also uh, detect uh, obstructive coronary artery disease. So we found this to be quite enticing and empowering in the cath lab. If we link this to pathology again, it's just to highlight the coronary circulation using IV adenosine, we can assess the fractional flow reserve. Coronary flow reserve takes account of the vasodilator capacity of the whole of the coronary circulation within the instrumented artery. The index of microvascular resistance is specific to the microcirculation. We can then add acetylcholine, as mentioned, um, to provide assessment of microvascular spasm or epicardial spasm, leading to a diagnosis of microvascular angina through these three metrics, or vasospastic angina, which is uh, specifically determined by the response of, of the coronary artery to acetylcholine. Of course, also coupled with the patient's response and the ECG response. So you have clinical ECG and coronary physiology integrated simultaneously in the cath lab. More widely, um, stratified medicine is a concept that has really been determined in oncology and is perhaps being superseded by the concept of precision medicine. Back in 2015, the UK Medical Research Council set up a working group that um, came out with a framework. It's a publication it's available on the internet with various definitions and guidance, this being one. Stratified medicine is the identification of subgroups of patients or endotypes 
with an un undifferentiated patient population, with these individuals being identified through evidence of specific disease mechanisms and or therapy responses. Well, we brought this together in a grant application, I'll not say the funder, but back in 2015, we submitted a grant called Carmica, and not only was it rejected, but as I reflect now, the parting statement was, do not resubmit. Thankfully, through a number of local initiatives, we were able to gain funding, and we ran the Carmica project as a clinical PhD, and eventually, uh, we did gain funding from the British Heart Foundation. The Carmica clinical study tests the hypothesis that stratified medicine in patients with no obstructive coronary arteries might lead to patient benefits as compared to anatomical or angiography guided management. Primary endpoint was the Seattle Angina questionnaire at six, at six months. So this is the framework for the Carmica study. It took place in the Golden Jubilee National Hospital, which is basically in, in Glasgow, with a catchment population across the, the west of Scotland for about 2.5 million people. And during a calendar year, 12 months, uh, our fellow, Dr. Tom Ford, screened elective referrals uh, coming into the hospital for coronary angiography for the assessment of known or suspected angina. So 391 patients gave informed consent before the angiogram. And they completed a, a series of questionnaires, including the Seattle Angina questionnaire. To my surprise, almost half of these patients had no obstructive coronary artery disease. These individuals were then uh, progressed uh, into the randomized trial. Actually, 151 of 185 uh, proceeded. So the trial population was 151. No obstructive coronary arteries, but symptoms consistent with angina. An interventional diagnostic procedure, or IDP, was then performed where the the guide wire and acetylcholine testing uh, were performed in, in succession. Uh, typically, uh, the target artery was the left anterior descending coronary artery. Uh, but in the spirit of a randomized controlled trial, the tests were obtained in the control group, but not disclosed. So effectively, it was a sham procedure in the, in the, the control group. The patients were randomized one to one. Questionnaires were completed again at six and indeed 12 months. These are the baseline characteristics. The uh, average age was 60 years. Three quarters of the patients were female. Um, overall, BMI was slightly increased and there was a prevalence uh, of uh, cardiovascular risk factors uh, and their 10-year likelihood of a CHD event was about uh, one in five. The patients completed questionnaires during follow-up and the results were provided to the clinical trials unit. The data were analyzed by statisticians who are not part of my research group. And then the results were returned to us. And these are the findings. So for the Seattle Angina questionnaire, the summary score in the intervention group improved um, more so, this is between group difference, uh, in the intervention group in red compared to the controls. This was associated also with improvements in physical limitation and angina frequency. Further, the diagnostic tests at baseline when disclosed to the consultant uh, led to a change in di diagnosis in one in two of the patients. The availability of the test results increased diagnostic certainty and a missed diagnosis occurred in one in three of the patients in the control groups. These diagnoses, of course, being microvascular angina, vasospastic angina, both, none, or, or I think there was one or two patients with flow-limiting uh, disease. 
And of course, when the diagnosis changed, so did the treatment, because we provide a treatment guideline for each of these conditions or endotypes. Other questionnaires for quality, health status and quality of life and treatment satisfaction also were associated with improvements in favour of the intervention. The patients continued with follow-up. There were no other contacts with the patients in the intervening time. And when they completed further questionnaires at 12 months, um, we did observe some um, trending improvements, such as with the Duke Activity Status Index, physical activity improved, um, blood pressure measurements and body weight also had some favorable changes. And you might ask, how could that possibly be the case? Well, as the diagnosis of ischemic heart disease uh, increased with the intervention, as the test results were disclosed, and ischemic, by ischemic heart disease, I mean basospastic angina and or microvascular angina, so the patients were referred for cardiac rehabilitation. And we think this has probably been the driver for these uh, longer term benefits. This is an overview of the Carmica study, as I've just explained. And I'll come on to this later, but we are further assessing the external validity of these findings in another trial. It just so happened that the European Society of Cardiology was undertaking a revision of its guidelines for the diagnosis and management of so-called chronic coronary syndromes. The Carmica study results had been published. The committee were aware of these results. And although I wasn't aware of the committee, because <laughs> uh, I was most surprised when the ESC uh, guidelines were released, it transpires that the Carmica study has directly informed a 2A guideline recommendation uh, for the use of these diagnostic tests, 2B for acetylcholine, and surprisingly, for non-invasive testing, only a 2B recommendation. And then um, we sought to enhance education uh, by publishing some reviews to the Covadis group, and it's great to see the, the widespread interest in ENOCA, ischemia with no obstructive coronary arteries, which is certainly almost exponentially increasing at this time. I've, I've kind of focused on uh, invasive diagnostics, but what about non-invasive diagnostics or ischemia testing? So look to this figure, non-invasive imaging of uh, coronary microvascular dysfunction. And this is an example of what I think uh, is pathological validation for the imaging features that we are able to uh, discern with quantitative perfusion MRI. So this again is another example of work done by my colleague, uh, Dr. William Fulton. If you look at this stereo arteriogram in an axial section, you will see the epicardial coronary arteries in cross section the radial penetrating uh, arterioles, the subendocardial plexus, and this is where a blood is delivered and then passes uh, from the endocardium to the epicardium, um, such as might be uh, uh, revealed in, in a wavefront of ischemia in the context of, of uh, coronary artery uh, obstruction. On the other hand, what we see here, if you look to the MRI images, if you look first to the rest perfusion scan on the right-hand side, and I think it's right at this moment to acknowledge those who contributed to these images obtained at least five years ago now, uh, Andrew Arai and Lee Hui Hsu at the USNIH. Uh, I worked in their lab back in 2008. Uh, and also uh, my colleagues at the NHS Golden Jubilee, Ness Orchard and David Corcoran. So clearly these images are separated temporally by about 50 years, but the rest perfusion scan um, shows homogeneous blood flow, one ml per minute per gram of tissue, 
But then during infusion of intravenous adenosine, look at the transmural perfusion gradient, which has got a circumferential distribution with relative uh, low flow in the subendocardium versus the increase in blood flow, probably around three mLs per minute per gram of tissue in the epicardium. And I think this is an example of microvascular uh, disease dysfunction with relative uh, hypoperfusion of the subendocardium, which spatially corresponds to the stereoarteriogram uh, developed by Dr. Fulton uh, some 50 years ago now. And right up to the current time, uh, we now have a series of publications using quantitative perfusion MRI with pixel mapping of myocardial blood flow, uh, notably uh, work done by Dr. Peter Kelman and Dr. Zhu, again at the NIH. This work has been implemented at the Royal Free Hospital in London. So if you look to the top of this flow diagram, stress perfusion CMR and myocardial perfusion mapping, the first step is, is there a regional perfusion defect? Yes or no? If yes, that points to the possibility of obstructive disease. And the cutoff in this study of quite a limited sample size, just I think around 50 patients, was 1.94 per ml per gram of tissue. On the other hand, if there is no perfusion defect, then considering the possibility of uh, microvascular disease and their, their study involved uh, angiography and invasive physiology with IMR and FFR as described earlier, that there was a high correspondence with a global hyperemic blood flow cutoff of 2.25 for an increase in IMR. So using uh, this approach, stress perfusion MRI can be useful for dichotomizing or discriminating obstructive disease versus microvascular disease in patients with chest pain. Work from another group in London uh, by Amadeo Chiribiri and Devaka Pereira, this time using 3T, and they have highlighted uh, that an MPR of 2.2 uh, can be discriminative for microvascular disease. So I've covered the chest pain setting, the cath lab, non-invasive imaging with a particular focus on CMR, but what about some of the wider contexts? I'd just like to highlight some uh, developments uh, in relation to sex dis differences and possibly disparities in ischemic heart disease, guidelines, Minoka, and systemic disease. So on the left, you're familiar with this image, of the microcirculation, but look to the coronary angiogram on the right, smooth coronary arteries, and we see very little from a standard coronary angiogram in relation to the microcirculation. Coming back to the Carmica study, and I indicated that we actually consented 391 patients. Um, 206 had obstructive disease and they formed the registry. Well, the minority of these patients were male, that were female. Uh, those with obstructive disease proportionately are, are more likely to be male. On the other hand, those with ischemia and no obstructive coronary arteries or ANOCA are proportionately more likely to be female. Inoka is, has actually been historically associated with Syndrome X, a greater de degree of uncertainty about what the symptoms might actually be in patients with chest pain or chest symptoms, but no block coronary arteries. So let's consider the Seattle Angina questionnaire. And here I've brought together our study with a reference study of coronary artery disease. That is the Orbita study. And just to compare, the age of the two populations is similar. And this is the randomized population in Carmica, not the registry, but the randomized population. And look at the differences by sex in the two populations. In Carmica, three, more, three quarters female. In Orbita, one quarter female. <clears throat> 
look at the angina scores. A lower SEQ score reflects a greater symptom burden. So the Inoka patients in Carmica had much more uh, oppressive symptoms as compared to those patients with single vessel coronary artery disease in Orbiter. And yet the SEQ score was historically de uh, developed for in, in patients with uh, coronary artery disease. I thought this was quite interesting. But let's come to this question about coronary heart disease or ischemic heart disease by sex. You might know the Scott Heart trial that uh, we supported here in Glasgow. Uh, 4,200 patients, um, half randomized to CT coronary angiography. This was a stable chest pain population. 60% uh, of those individuals with an obstructed coronary artery were males. Again, coming back to Carmica, three quarters of the patients with Inoka were female. And I would suggest that this is quite revealing on how angina differs by cause according to sex. The angina in men is much more likely to be due to obstructive disease. And at least small vessel disease as a cause of angina is much more likely to occur in women. If you, one uses terms such as coronary artery disease and coronary heart disease, when considering a patient with angina, the term CHD implies or associates with obstructive disease and potentially introduces a sex bias if this is applied or used in an unselected population, biasing against the possibility of a test or a diagnosis or management for ANOCA. And does that matter? Well, Scott Hart included a symptoms sub-study by protocol. All of the patients were invited to complete questionnaires. And if you look at the, 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 the CT guided group, physical limitation and angina frequency and indeed quality of life were worse in the CT guided group as compared to standard care quite the opposite to, let's say, the main findings of the study. And perhaps this might, this effect, which is probably due to several factors, might in part be explained by the discontinuation of angina treatment in patients who had no obstructive coronary artery disease, because the study was all about diagnosing and treating coronary artery disease. And so if patients had angina but no coronary artery disease or no obstructive coronary disease, their treatment was discontinued. And this might very well have led to deterioration in symptoms in affected patients. If we now look to the clinical guidelines that have been informed by Scott Hart, the sign guidelines, the acute coronary syndromes, management of stable angina, and also the NICE guidelines, putting aside the results from that study, it's quite interesting to observe that terms such as microvascular angina, minoca, SCAD, are not mentioned at all in these guidelines. Again, suggesting that there is a sex bias operative in the, in the guideline development group uh, and more widely in medicine and cardiology. But there are responses um, moving uh, to advance thinking in this regard. The British Heart Foundation uh, introduced a policy report called Bias and Biology that we were glad to contribute to. And also the Scottish government for the first time has included heart disease in the Women's Health Plan. And looking to the guidelines more widely, the ESC has introduced what could be considered a more personalized approach to the management of chronic coronary syndromes and I would contend that that is also the case happily in the new North American guidelines for chest pain and um, 
just recently published. So these are the guideline recommendations uh, through Carmica. And just in the interest of time, I'll keep going, but just to touch upon that we are mindful of the systemic impl impl potential implications of small vessel disease and that this is an area of current study. If we think about acute coronary syndromes and no obstructive coronary arteries, that being MINOCA, there's really very little data on this subject. This is an interesting paper from Filippo Crea's group in Rome where acetylcholine testing was undertaken in Minoka patients. The study only involved 80 patients, probably quite selected, but when they followed up the patients for five years, those who had uh, a constrictor response to acetylcholine uh, did much worse. It's a study that probably needs to be repeated uh, to assess the validity of these findings. So future directions in clinical trials. I'm um, in the final section of my talk, hopefully we're okay for time. So the Carmica study was for us the first study of stratified medicine in ischemic heart disease, possibly the first study of stratified medicine cardiology. And from that point, as I say, from a reject in 2014-2015, we've been able to extend this work um, into HEFPEF with the CORPEF study just recently published in JAMA Cardiology. We've got a new study called CORCTCA, which I'll describe shortly, and we have an imaging registry. And this work continues to grow. We have clinical trials now involving uh, an endothelial receptor antagonist. This is the PRICE study. The CARMICA trial is now uh, being assessed in the context of an international study called iCARMICA. And I'd like to just share some of the details about this work um, to conclude. So the CORE CTCA study, the British Art Foundation, coronary microvascular function, and CT coronary angiography trial. So this study addresses the, the conundrum that patients might have chest pain and yet no obstructive coronary arteries. And it's clinically relevant because in the UK, CT coronary angiography is recommended as the first line test over all others. So um, Dr. Navalia Sadiq, a uh, clinical PhD fellow, um, and myself, we got a grant. And the study protocol involved screening patients who'd been referred for CT for stable chest pain. We enrolled 250 patients um, who had chest pain, dash angina, but no obstructive coronary arteries. And usually these patients would be referred back to the attending clinician. Increasingly, that would be a video consultation at best. Certainly, typically would be discharged from the clinic. So what we have done is the exact opposite. We ask them to come to the cath lab uh, for an invasive evaluation of the ang by angiography and the microcirculation. And uh, in order to test whether such results might be meaningful clinically through management uh, guided and informed by the results of these tests. As in Carmica, we made these measurements in all patients and randomly disclosed the results to the clinician in half in the context of a randomized trial. We hope to re report the results of the core CTCA study at some point in 2022. It's certainly been challenging uh, to undertake this work in the context of the COVID pandemic. I'm pleased to say that 250 patients have undergone invasive evaluation. And to Navalia's great credit, she formally screened 2,136 patients in three hospitals across the west of Scotland. She felt that 1,500 of these patients had one fide chest pain. And then following disclosure of the CT result where there was no obstructive uh, coronary atherosclerosis, uh, 
She then invited 322 to have this protocol and 250 agreed and attended. On the right hand side, you'll see the baseline characteristics of these patients, 62% uh, um, were female, and then there's a broad range of cardiovascular risk factors. So this kind of fits with this paradigm that chest pain in women uh, is more uh, preponderantly associated with obstructive coronary arteries. But let's look for the results um, later in 2022. ICRMICA, multi-center clinical trial of the CRMICA uh, strategy, uh, fully blinded. Uh, again, as in CRMICA, patients are assessed on their way into the cath lab, invited to take part in three questionnaires, and we've implemented a double-blind design so the patients and the clinicians downstream don't know the results, but they do know a diagnosis which is informed in the intervention group by the results of the IDP tests. And in the control group, it's standard care guided by the angiogram. We would really need 15,000 patients for a cardiovascular outcome, um, such as uh, death and MI. But with 1,500 patients, we are well, well powered on the Seattle Angina uh, questionnaire score. This is the schedule of assessments with questionnaires repeatedly during the first 12 months. And then these patients will be followed up lifelong through electronic record link linkage. These are the primary and the secondary outcomes. To the prize study, so, so clinicians would say, well, look, what's the point in making these tests with associated costs and theoretical risks? when we could just treat the patients conservatively, empirically, even if we're not really sure exactly what the diagnosis is. And there isn't any specific treatment, so what's the point? So we are addressing that, that evidence gap through the PRI study. Precision medicine with zibotentine, which is an endothelin A receptor selective antagonist in patients with clinical microvascular angina. Again, I'd like to recognize the role of the fellow in this project, uh, Dr. Andrew Morrow. <clears throat> um, there are a few interesting features uh, to this study, but in addition to microvascular angina, we are looking at the genotype of the patients, and there is one particular uh, allele or SNP gene variant that enhances endothelin uh, production, and we are enriching the study population with individuals who have this uh, gene variant, uh, putatively, that leading to enhanced endothelin and hopefully an enhanced response to an endothelin receptor blocker. This is a double blind placebo controlled crossover trial. So, after a screening and medical optimization phase, including with the genotype enrichment process. Um, patients would be assigned to 10 milligrams of zipotentan a day for 12 weeks or placebo, or in the other order assigned at random. And each phase is preceded by an exercise tolerance test and some blood and questionnaires, blood tests and questionnaires. So again, what a challenge it's been to undertake this study in the pandemic. But we think we're getting there, and hopefully we'll be able to complete it sometime in 2022 or early 2023. And it's involving at least 10 sites, hopefully a few more uh, across the UK, and credit to my colleagues for keeping this study, study running. So this is my final slide, just to conclude. Ischemia with no obstructive coronary arteries is probably common in an unselected chest pain population. Indeed, it might be much more common than obstructive coronary artery disease. The symptom burden is at least comparable and there are emerging treatment options. The CARMICA trial was a pathfinder study for stratified medicine using specific tests 
with linked treatment, suggesting uh, in this mainly single centre study for patient benefits and indeed health economic benefits as well. And we are reassessing that st study at scale through the ICA-MICA trial with some other studies such as POS TCCA. And I also have finally highlighted the wider context in relation to, for example, uh, sex uh, bias and disparities in cardiology. So with that, I'll stop. Hope you found this interesting and I'll welcome your questions. It's a terrific review of uh, this complex topic and so much to learn uh, from a disease that we thought was in the head. It might be in the head still somewhat, <laughs> but uh, the heart and the, and the mind are connected, aren't it? I'll, I'll get yeah. started with one question. Uh, then we'll have questions from uh, here, the audience too, and some uh, virtual presence. Um, you know, it, it's incredible the amount of work uh, that you are wor uh, you know, developing in this field, uh, Colin. And one piece that I would like to uh, maybe um, gather from you, your insights is, you know, when to evaluate for, you divide it into two, the MVA, the microvascular engine, and the vasospastic. Uh, when should we consider vasospastic engine a, a screening, an evaluation? Because the logistics were acetylcholine, it are not trivial. And do we have a, a better non-invasive strategy to evaluate these patients up front? Right. So, first of all, um, the, the medical history and the patient responses um, as in relation to how they describe their symptoms. So vasospastic uh, symptoms, uh, symptoms with a vasospastic origin <clears throat> typically occur at rest. And so, for example, chest pain that wakes a patient from their sleep um, chest pain that occurs spontaneously, including when the weather is cold. Also, after, after periods of effort or stress, chest pain may occur spontaneously in the hours and days afterwards. It's, that's certainly a report I've, I've heard from patients. Of course, um, this associates with female sex, but such symptoms may also occur in men, of course. Coming to diagnostic testing non-invasively, so vasospastic uh, problems or disease does associate with micro, microvascular uh, disease and atherosclerotic risk factors. So more likely than not that a perfusion scan will also be abnormal in these patients. It could, however, be normal. And therefore, that's why the symptoms and the wider context, you know, is this patient attending the emergency department and getting sent away repeatedly? Um, when then uh, maybe direct referral to the cath lab would be appropriate. Coming to acetylcholine, so this is an off-label use. Uh, there's certainly training and experience needed because it should be administered with care. And you know, um, the evidence for using acetylcholine, on the one hand, there are studies dating back 30, 40 years. On the other hand, there's really only one trial, which is Carmica. Uh, so hopefully that will change in the months and years ahead. So it's not unreasonable to not to include acetylcholine testing, absolutely, because of the logistics costs and, and medical legal considerations. Um, so this is probably a work in progress, and maybe in 10 years' time, the management will be better established. Terrific. Uh, do we have questions from the um, chat there, John? Yes, we do. Thank you, Dr. Cavalcante, and thank you, Dr. Barry, very much for that excellent presentation. Uh, our first online question comes from Dr. John Lesser, and he asks, do you have any preliminary information about the presence and extent of non-obstructive coronary artery disease and the specific diagnosis obtained with invasive measurements, uh, for example, IMR, CFR, or FFR? Yes. So Carmica was fundamentally a diagnostic study 
and one of disease prevalence. Um, so <clears throat> in a chest pain population assessed for angina in the cath lab, admittedly selectively referred to the cath lab, <clears throat> in the group of patients who have no obstructive coronary disease, so that, as I pointed out, is probably around half. So in that half with no, no blocked coronary arteries, probably three to four and five may have an abnormality of the microcirculation. That was the main finding from Cormica. Of course, the prevalence in part is influenced by the tests that are used and the test sensitivity. But we we do think that acetylcholine, um, especially if used according to standardized pharmacological protocol, is quite a sensitive uh, tool for this eliciting microvascular spasm and, and uh, coronary artery spasm. Isolated coronary spasm was about 18%. Uh, microvascular dysfunction, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, just over half of these patients and, uh, with acetylcholine. And then IMR per se, I think, of, as I recall correctly, was around uh, 40%. So if you bring all of these tests together, <clears throat> because of course, each one of them specifically reflects an abnormality or not, such as a vasomotor problem, a resistance problem, or a vasodilator problem, um, about four and five patients. I'll stop at that. Is there a continuum between microvascular dysfunction and half path? And then also, is there any pathological data out there looking at like rarefaction of the microcirculation or vessel density or, uh, you know, microvessel studies, just looking at like what the triggers are for this uh, microvascular spasm? So there is a growing literature on uh, vascular function in HEFPEF, both peripherally and in the coronary circulation. Uh, there are I think about five cohort studies now published, um, perhaps the most recent being our own in JAMA Cardiology, but that was preceded by a notable study, multi-center study led by uh, Dr. Caroline Lamb and colleagues in North America and the European Heart Journal. Um, interestingly, in HFPF, coronary artery disease is an important uh, complicating feature. So it's not, one that's isolated within the, the vascular context. This is not an isolated uh, vasomotor uh, problem that actually coronary atherosclerosis we found was prevalent also. Uh, to your question about uh, pathological studies, so Fulton's work's amazing, but it wasn't quantitative. And uh, in, in this day, um, CT, uh, does not have the resolution. So going to the, uh, the pathology lab, um, I think there's probably very limited information from human pathology studies um, or indeed experimental studies. I think there is some renewed interest with Dirk Dunker in Rotterdam. He's worked in this area in pig models of microvascular disease. So again, I think perhaps as the wider community engages in this space, then we might look forward to uh, more studies. But certainly pathological studies in, in human pathological studies is, is difficult to undertake. By contrast, if you think about heart transplantation and even coronary artery bypass surgery, it was a much more straightforward process, if that's the appropriate term to use, to get pathological validation uh, in relation to coronary heart disease uh, because of the surgical procedures that are performed for that patient group. Scott. Um, thank you, Dr. Berry. And this, this is sort of a follow-up question, I, I guess. Uh, what Can you comment on the evidence that uh, microvascular dysfunction actually is, is a cause of myocardial infarction? And how do you 
what are your thoughts on how to actually study this uh, association? Right. So we are quite interested in, in looking, uh, well, we've got a protocol in Minoka. Um, there's very little undertaken in Minoka. Uh, they're just about to start. Another uh, possibility would be to look at troponin in relation to acetylcholine responses, a troponin time course study. That's something else that would be quite interested to do. Coming to uh, imaging, I, mean, I, I think whilst human pathology studies will always, always be narrowly limited, so MRI, multi-parametric MRI, is really serving us as a, a non-invasive pathologist. So these patients, um, that is those with chronic chest pain who've maybe attended A&E and been hospitalized ad hoc, they typically have small troponin elevations or they have detectable troponin that is not above the 99th centile, it's often the case. And I think this is my anecdotal report to you because we have done a fair amount of MRI. The, the infarct patterns are, are really small. So LV function tends to be well preserved. It's quite a different natural history as compared to coronary artery disease. But nonetheless, these patients are definitely attending urgent care and being admitted. But I think their prognosis is detrimentally affected by arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, HEFPEF, small MIs. Um, so they, I believe that they get hospitalized almost just as often, but the problems, uh, in, in other words, the natural history differs. John, there is one more question there from... Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Berry, for your time. Uh, this final uh, online question comes from Dr. Robert Hauser, who asks, have you evaluated arrhythmias in these patients, and do Inoka patients differ? So, um, well, the, the one thing that obvious comes to my mind is that atrial fibrillation occurs um, in association with acetylcholine testing. So in Carmica, we had nine patients who had an escape AF. Uh, that's probably iatrogenic. Uh, only one of these patients required IV amiodarone. Uh, the, for the others, it resolved in the cath lab almost immediately. So that's my kind of first-hand first experience of arrhythmias in such patients. Your question is more to do with arrhythmias as a consequence of, 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 of this diagnosis in natural history. I think there's an evidence gap there. It's not been systematically assessed. It is something that we hope to do through our electronic record linkage. I'm not aware of, for example, a 24, 48 hour or seven day monitoring, not, of, not aware of revealed device implantation uh, studies. Um, so again, there's just, it's really an under-researched area. I think, you know, coronary heart disease has been the paradigm for the past 50 years, probably to the neglect and detriment of, of patients with angina that's just as bad, um, but due to small vessel problems that hitherto we've been un, un, unable to see and so underappreciated. Now, this is a, a very important point and, and one that I would like to ask a final question here, uh, Colin, is as you show in Cormica, one of the most important interventions you talk about stratified medicine was actually the use of cardiac rehab. So exercise as a medicine was quite important. Um, is exercise probably the best treatment that we might have uh, for these patients? What are your thoughts on that? Lifestyle is the first thing I raise with my patients. Um, Cardiovascular uh, risk factors do seem to be more prevalent, even in, in these sort of Vinoka patients without blocked coronary arteries. And it's uh, an assailable target. Uh, and it's also can be empowering for the patients if they can take ownership more of change in their, in their life and, and improvements in well-being. Uh, clearly, medicine has an important and specific uh, potential role, but 
yeah, exercise, weight loss, discontinuation of cigarette smoking, um, mindfulness, yoga, these can all be helpful in, a, in an individualized way. About the use of EECP in these uh, patients with microvascular uh, dysfunction, if, if uh, you've had uh, any experience using that therapy uh, and yeah. resolution of their symptoms. Yeah, so I don't have experience. Um, there is a vendor in the UK which has approached us. Um, it's difficult in the public sector to advance um, such a such a treatment paradigm in the absence of firm evidence. Uh, I think probably there is a case for a, a clinical trial with um, uh, extracorporeal uh, counterpulsation, um, as is the case also for some other device approaches, such as the coronary sinus occluder, mm. um, which now I believe one or two clinical trials are uh, underway for a coronary sinus uh, device. So I think it's an interesting and exciting time. We can look forward to uh, therapy uh, evidence to, uh, to support or refute uh, each of these uh, as, as treatment options. Terrific. Well, I wanted to thank you again uh, very much for your time and educating us here. I really appreciate um, you know, today and we'll look forward to you know, seeing together soon. And happy holidays. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And to you. Bye-bye.